Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode, it's Thriller Thursday where I bring you tales of fiction. In this episode, it's The Super Opener by Michael Zeroy. It's a story that I narrated for another podcast I work with entitled Auditory Anthology, which comes out with a science fiction story every week with me as the narrator. I'll link to that podcast in the show notes for you. I loved narrating this particular story due to the characters that I had to create for it. In fact, I enjoyed it so much I produced it with music and sound effects, but normally I'd leave that up to Keith, the producer of Auditory Anthology. I just got ahead of myself and was having fun. I hope you enjoy the story as much as I did. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks that I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Beach! grated Ogden Pilton, president of the Pilton Opener Company, slamming the drafting board with his hairy fist. I want results! Heads lifted over boards. Calvin Feech shrunk visibly. "'As chief engineer, you're not carrying the ball!' Pilton went on savagely. "'The Pilton can opener is trailing the competition. Advertising and sales are breaking their necks. It's engineering that's missing the boat!' "'But, Mr. Pilton,' remonstrated Feech unsteadily under his employer's glare, "'don't you remember? I tried to—' "'For two years there hasn't been one lousy improvement in the Pilton can opener!' roared Mr. Pilton. Look at our competitors. The International rips apart cans in three and three-tenths seconds. Universal does it in four. But, Mr. Pilton, the Minerva Mighty Midget does it in 4.2 and plays home sweet home in chimes. Our own Pilton opener barely manages to open a can in 8.9 without chimes. Is this what I'm paying you for? Feech adjusted his spectacles with shaking hands. But, Mr. Pilton, our opener still has stability, solidity. It's built to last. It has dignity. Dignity, produced Pilton, is for museums. Four months, Feech. In four months, I want a new can opener that'll be faster, lighter, stronger, flashier, and more musical than any on the market. I want it completely developed, engineered, and tooled up, ready for production. Otherwise, Feech. Feech's body twitched. But, Mr. Pilton, four months is, is hardly enough time for development, even with inadequate staff. I've been trying to tell you for years that we're bound to fall behind because we don't have enough personnel to conduct research. Our men can barely keep up with production and maintenance. If you would let me put on a few draftsmen and excuses, sneered Mr. Pilton, your staff is more than adequate. I will not allow you to throw out my money. Four months, Feech, no more. Pilton trudged out of the room, leaving behind him an oppressive silence. How could you set a time limit on research and development? A designer had to dream at his board, investigate, search, build, test, compare, discard. He had always wanted to devote all his time to research, but Pilton Opener had not given him that opportunity. Twenty-five years, thought Feech, 
25 years of close supervision, deadlines, production headaches, inadequate facilities and assistance. What had happened to the proud dream he once had, the dream of exploring uncharted engineering regions, of unlimited time to investigate and develop? Ah well, thought Feech, straightening his thin shoulders. He'd managed somehow to design a few good things during his 25 years with Pilton. That was some satisfaction. What now? He had to hang on to his job. Technical work was scarce. Since the early 1980s, the schools had been turning out more technicians than industry could absorb. He was too old to compete in the employment market. He couldn't afford to lose any money. Jenny wasn't well. How to meet this four-month deadline? He'd get right on it himself, of course. Hanson, good man, could work with him. He shook his head despairingly. Something would be sure to blow up. Well, he had to start. Chief, said Hanson a few weeks later as they entered the lab, I'm beginning to wonder if the answer is in the hand mechanical type at all. Gotta be, answered Feech tiredly. We must work along classical can opener lines. Departures, such as the thermal or motor driven types, would be too expensive for mass production. Three new models and a group of cans were waiting for them on the bench. They began testing, Hansen operating the openers and Feech clocking. Four point four, announced Feech after the last test. Good, but not good enough. Too bulky. Appearance unsatisfactory. Chimes uh, tinny. We've made progress, but we've a long way to go. The problem was tricky. It might seem that use of the proper gear ratios would give the required velocity, but there were too many other factors that negated this direct approach. The mechanism had to be compact and streamlined. Gear sizes had to be kept down. Can top resistance, internal resistance, cutting tooth performance, handle size and moment, the minimum strength of a woman's hand or some of the variables that had to be balanced within rigid limits. Sector type cutters traversing several arcs at the same time had seemed to offer the answers for a while, but the adjusting mechanism necessary to compensate for variable can sizes had been too complex to be practical. There was the ever-present limit to production cost. Hansen's eyes were upon him. Chief, he said, it's a rotten shame. Twenty-five years of your life you put in with Pilton and he'd fire you just like that if you don't do the impossible? The Pilton company's built upon your designs and you get handed this deal. Well, well, said Feech, I drew my pay every week, so I suppose I have no complaints. Although... A wistful note crept into his voice. I would have liked a little recognition. Pilton is a household word. But who's heard of Feech? Well, Feech blew his nose. How do we stand, Hanson? Hanson's bulldog features drew into a scowl. Pilton ought to be raid, he growled. Okay, Chief. Eleven experimental models designed to date. Two more on the boards, nine completed and tested, two in work. Best performances, 4.4, but model otherwise unsatisfactory. Uh, hello, said Feech, as an apron machinist entered carrying a glistening mechanism. Here's another model, let's try it. The machinist departed, and Hansen locked the opener on a can. I hope, he turned the handle and stopped abruptly, staring down, open-mouthed. A cylinder of close-packed beans rested on the bench under the opener. The can itself had disappeared. A chief? said Hanson. A chief? Yes, said Feech. I see it too. Try another can. Vegetable soup or spinach? inquired Hanson dreamily. Spinach, I think, said Feech. Where did the can go, do you suppose? The spinach can disappeared. Likewise, several corn cans, 
sweet potato cans and corned beef hash cans leaving their contents intact. It was rather disconcerting. Dear, dear, said Feech, regarding the piles of food on the bench, there must be some explanation. I designed this opener with 16-degree, 22-minute pressure angle modified involute gear teeth, 7-degree, 19-minute front clearance cutter angle, and 36-degree, 12-minute back rake angle. I expected that such departures from the norm might achieve unconventional performance, but this… dear, dear, where do the cans go, I wonder? What's the difference? Don't you see what you've got here? It's the answer! It's more than the answer! We can put this right into work and beat the deadline!" Feech shook his head. No, Hanson. We're producing something we don't understand. What forces have we uncovered here? Where do the cans go? What makes them disappear? Are we dealing with a kinetic or kinematic effect? What motions can we plot in the areas of disappearance? And what are their analytical mathematical formulae? What masses may be critical here? What transformations of energy are involved? No, Hanson, we must learn a lot more. But, Chief, your job! I'll risk that. Not a word to Pilton. Several days later, however, Pilton himself charged into the drawing room and slapped Feech heartily on the back, causing him to break a pencil point. Feech! roared Pilton. Is this talk that's going around the plant true? Why didn't you tell me? Let's see it!" After Pilton had seen it, his eyes took on a feverish glint. This, he exulted, will make can opener history! Instantaneous opening! Automatic disposal? <laughs> Wait until advertising and sales get a hold of this! We'll throttle our competitors! The Pilton Super Opener, we'll call it! Mr. Pilton," said Feech shakily. Pilton stared at his chief engineer sharply. What's the matter, Feech? The thing can be duplicated, can't it? Yes, sir. I've just finished checking that. But I'm in the midst of further investigation of the effect. There's more here than just a new type can opener, sir. A whole new field of physics. New principles. This is big, Mr. Pilton. I recommend that we delay production until further research could be completed. Hire a few top scientists and engineers. Find where the cans go. Put out a scientific paper on the effect." Feech! bit out Pilton, his face growing hard. Stow this hooey! I don't give a damn where the cans go! May I remind you that under our standard patent agreement, all rights to your invention belong to the company as well as anything you may produce in the field within a year after leaving our employ. We have a good thing here, and I don't want you holding it back. We're going into production immediately." Close, thought Feech warily. It had been a man-killing job, and it had been close, but he'd made it. Beat the time limit by half a day. The first tentative shipments of Pilton Super Openers had gone to distributors along the eastern seaboard. The first advertisements blazed in selected media. The first reorders came back, and then, "'It's a sellout!' crowed Pilton, waving a sheaf of telegrams. "'Step up production! Let her rip!' The super openers rolled over the country. In a remarkably short time, they appeared in millions of kitchens from coast to coast. Sales climbed to hundreds of thousands per day, Pilton openers went into peak production in three shifts, but was still unable to keep up with the demand. Construction was begun on a new plant, and additional plants were planned. Long lines waited in front of houseware stores. Department stores, lucky enough to have super openers on hand, limited sales to one to a customer. Pilton canceled his advertising program. Newspapers, magazines, radio, television, and word of mouth spread the fame of the opener so that advertising was unnecessary. Meanwhile, of course, government scientists, research foundations, universities, and independent investigators began to look into this new phenomenon. Receiving no satisfactory explanation from Pilton, they set up their own research. Far into the night burned the lights of countless laboratories. Noted physicists probed, measured, weighed, traced, x-rayed, dissolved, spun, peered at, 
photographed, magnetized, exploded, shattered, and analyzed super openers without achieving the glimmer of a satisfactory explanation. Competitors found the patent impossible to circumvent, for any departure from its exact specifications nullified the effect. Pilton, genial these days with success and acclaim, roared at Feach, I'm putting you in for a raise, <laughs> yes sir, to reward you for assisting me with my invention, I'm raising your pay $200 a year, that's almost $4 a week, man! Thank you, Mr. Pilton. And still, thought Feach wryly, he received no recognition. His name did not even appear on the patent. Well, well, that was the way it went. He must find his satisfaction in his work. And it had been interesting lately. The work he'd been doing nights at home investigating what had been named the Pilton Effect. It had been difficult, working alone and buying his own equipment. The oscillator and ultra-microwave tracking unit had been particularly expensive. He was a fool, he supposed, to try independent research when so many huge scientific organizations were working on it. But he could no more keep away from it than he could stop eating. He still didn't know where the cans went, but somehow he felt that he was close to the answer. When he finally found the answer, it was too late. The Borenchunk incident was only hours away. As soon as he could get a hold of Pilton, Feech said, trembling, "'Sir, uh, I think I know where those cans are going. Uh, I recommend—' "'Are you still worrying about that?' Pilton roared jovially. "'Leave that to the long hairs. We're making money. That's all that counts, eh, Feech?' That night, at 6.10 p.m., the Borenchuk family of Selby, South Dakota, sat down to their evening meal. Just as they started in on the soup, a rain of empty tin cans clattered down, splashed into the soup, raised a welt on the forehead of Borenchunk Sr., settled down to a gentle, steady clunk, 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 and inexorably began to pile up on the dining room floor. They seemed to materialize from a plane just below the ceiling. The police called the fire department, and the fire department stared helplessly and recommended the sanitation department. The incident made headlines in the local papers. The next day, other local papers in widely scattered locations reported similar incidents. The following day, cans began falling on Chicago. St. Louis was next, and then, over the entire nation, the cans began to rain down. They fell outdoors and indoors, usually materializing at heights that were not dangerous. The deluge followed no pattern. Sometimes it would slacken, sometimes it would stop sometimes begin heavily again. It fell in homes, on the streets, in theaters, trains, ships, universities, and dog food factories. No place was immune. People took to wearing hats indoors and out, and the sale of helmets boomed. All activity was seriously curtailed. A state of national emergency was declared. Government investigators went to work and soon confirmed what was generally suspected. These were the same cans that had been opened by the Pilton Super Opener. Statisticians and mathematicians calculated the mean rate of can precipitation and estimated that if all the cans opened by Pilton Openers were to come back, the deluge should be over in 15.29 days. Super Opener sales, of course, immediately plummeted to zero and stayed there. Anti-Pilton editorials appeared in the papers. Commentators accused Pilton of deliberately hoaxing the public for his own gain. A congressional investigation was demanded. Pilton received threats of bodily injury. Lawsuits were filed against him. He barricaded himself in the plant, surrounded by bodyguards. Livid with fury and apprehension, he screamed at Feech, "'This is your doing, you vandal! I'm a ruined man!' A falling can caught him neatly on the tip of the nose. "'But, sir trembled Feech, dodging three spaghetti cans. I tried to warn you. You're through, Feech, raved Pilton. Fired! Get out! But before you go, I want you to know that I've directed the blame where it belongs. I've just released to the press the truth about who created the super opener. Now get out! Yes, sir, said Feech, paling. Then you don't want to hear about my discovery of a way to prevent the cans from coming back? 
A barrage of cans hit the floor and both men took refuge under Pilton's huge desk. No! yelled Pilton at Feech's face, which was inches away. No! I, wh what did you say? A small design improvement, sir, and the cans would disappear forever. Forever, Feech? Yes, sir. You're positive, Feech? Pilton's eyes glared into Feech's. Sir, I never make careless claims. That's true, said Pilton. His eyes grew dreamy. It can be done, he mused. The new type super opener. Free exchanges for the old. Cash guarantee that empty cans will never bother you. Take a licking at first, but then monopolize the market. All right, Feech, I'll give you another chance. You'll turn over all the details to me. The patent on the improvement will naturally be mine. I'll get the credit for rectifying your blunder. Fine, fine. We'll work it out. Hop on production at once, Feech. Feech felt himself sag inwardly. Mr. Pilton, he said, I'm asking only one favor. Let me work full time on research and development, especially on the Pilton effect. Hire a couple of extra men to help with production. I assure you the company will benefit in the end. Damn it, no! roared Pilton. How many times must I tell you? You got your job back, didn't you? The prospect of long years of heavy production schedules, restricted engineering, and tight supervision suddenly made Calvin Feech feel very tired. Research, he thought. Development. What he had always wanted. Over the years, he had waited, thinking that there would be opportunities later. But now he was growing older, and he felt that there might not be a later. Somehow, he would manage to get along. Perhaps someone would give him a job working in the new field he had pioneered. With a sense of relief, he realized that he had made his decision. Mr. Pilton, Beach said, I resign. Pilton started, extreme astonishment crossing his face. No use, said Feech. Nothing you can say will make any difference now. But see here, the new type super opener will remain my secret. Good day. Feech, howled Pilton. I order you to remain. Feech almost submitted from force of habit. He hesitated for a moment, then turned abruptly. Good day, said Feech firmly, sprinting through the falling cans to the door. Money, Feech decided after a while, was a good thing to have. His supply was running pretty low. He was not having any luck finding another job. Although the cans had stopped falling on the 15th day, as predicted by the statisticians, industry would not soon forget the inconvenience and losses caused by the deluge. It was not anxious to hire the man it regarded as responsible for the whole thing. Feech, the personnel man would read, Calvin Feech. Then looking up, not THE Calvin Feech who… Yes, Feech would admit miserably, I'm sorry, but… He did no better with research organizations. Typical was a letter from the Van Terrell Foundation. Cannot accept your application inasmuch as we feel your premature application of your discovery to profit-making denotes a lack of scientific responsibility and ethics not desirable in a member of our organization. Former employer states the decision was yours entirely. Unfavorable reference. Pilton, Feech thought, feeling a strange sensation deep within his chest that he had not the experience to recognize as the beginning of a slow anger. Pilton was hitting low and getting away with it. Of course, if he were to agree to reveal his latest discoveries to a research organization, he would undoubtedly get an appointment. But how could he? Everything patentable in his work would automatically revert to Pilton under the one-year clause in the company patent agreement. No, Beach told himself, he was revealing nothing that Pilton might grab. The anger began to mount. But he was beginning to need money, desperately. Jenny wasn't getting any better, and medical bills were running high. The phone rang. Feech seized it and said to the image, "'Absolutely not!' "'I'll go up another ten dollars,' grated the little Pilton image. "'Do you realize, man, this is the 
eighth raise I've offered you? A total increase of $126? Be sensible, Feach. I know you can't find work anywhere else. Thanks to you, Mr. Pilton. I wouldn't work for you if… A barrage of rocks crashed against the heavy steel screening of the window. What's going on? yelled Pilton. Oh, I see. People throwing rocks at your house again? Oh, I know all about that, Feach. I know that you're probably the most unpopular man alive today. I know about the rocks, the tomatoes, the rotten eggs, the sneaking out at night, the disguises you've had to use. Why don't you come back to us and change all that, Feach? We'll put out the new type super opener and the world will soon forget about the old one. No, said Feach. People will forget anyway. I hope. If you won't think of yourself, at least think of your fellow workmen begged Pilton, his voice going blurry. Do you realize that the Pilton opener will soon be forced to close down, throwing all your former associates out of work? Think of Hanson, Sanchez, Forbes. They have families, too. Think of the men in the shop, the girls in the office, the salesmen on the road, all, all unemployed because of you. Think of that, Feach. Feach blinked. This had not occurred to him. Pilton eyed him sharply, then smiled with a hint of triumph. Think it over, Feech. Feech sat, thinking it over. Was it right to let all these people lose their jobs? Frowning, he dialed Hanson's number. Chief, said Hanson, forget it. The boys are behind you 100%. We'll make out. But that's the trouble. I thought you'd feel like this, and I can't let you. You're beginning to weaken. Don't think, Chief, think. The brain that figured the super opener can solve this. Beach hung up. A glow of anger that had been building up in his chest grew warmer. He began pacing the floor. How he hated to do it. Think, Hanson had said. But he had. He'd considered every angle, and there was no solution. Beach walked into the kitchen and carefully poured himself a drink of water. He drank the water slowly and placed the glass on the washstand with a tiny click. It was the tiny click that did it. Something about it touched off the growing rage. If Pilton were there, he would have punched him in the nose. The 25 years. The tricks. The threats. Think! He'd figured the solution long ago, only he hadn't allowed himself to see it. Not lack of brains. Lack of guts. Well, he thought grimly, dialing Pilton's number. He was going through with it now. Pilton, he barked. 3 p.m. tomorrow, my place. Be here, that's all. He hung up. In the same grim mood the following morning, he placed a few more calls. In the same mood that afternoon, he stood in the middle of his living room and looked at his visitors. Pilton, Williams, the government man, Billings from the Van Terrell Foundation, Steiner of Westchester University, the members of the press. Gentlemen, he said, I'll make it brief. He waved the papers in his hand. Here is everything I know about what I call the Feech effect, including plans and specifications for the new type super opener. All of you have special reasons for being keenly interested in this information. I am now going to give a copy to each of you, providing one condition is met by Mr. Pilton." He stared at Pilton. In short, I want 51% of the stock of Pilton Opener. Pilton leaped from his chair. Outrageous! He roared. Ridiculous! 51%, said Feech firmly. Don't bother with any counterproposals or the interview is at an end. Uh, gentlemen! squawked Pilton. I appeal to you! Stop bluffing, said Feech coldly. There's no other way out for you, otherwise you are ruined. Here, sign this agreement. Pilton threw the paper to the floor and screamed, G Gentlemen, will you be a party to this? Well, murmured the government man, I never did think Feech got a fair shake. This information is important to science, said the Van Terrell man. After Pilton had signed, the papers were distributed. Published in the newspapers the following day, Feech's statement read in part, 
The motion in space and time of the singular, curvilinear proportions of the original super-opener combined with the capacitor effect built up as it increased its frictional electrostatic charge in inverse proportion to the cube root of the tolerance between the involute teeth caused an instantaneous disruption of what I call the alpha multidimensional screen. The can, being metallic, dropped through, leaving its non-metallic contents behind. The disruption was instantly repaired by the stable nature of the screen. Beyond the screen is what I call alpha space, a space apparently quite as extensive as our own universe. Unfortunately, as my investigations indicated, alpha space seems to be thickly inhabited. These inhabitants, the nature of whom I have not yet ascertained, obviously resented the intrusion of the cans, developed a method of disrupting the screen from their side, and hurled the cans back at us. However, I have established the existence of other spaces up to mu space, and suspect that others exist beyond that. Beta space, which is also adjacent to our own space, is devoid of any form of life. The new type super opener is designed to pass cans through the beta screen. Beta space will safely absorb an infinite number of cans. I sincerely and humbly venture the opinion that we are on the threshold of tremendous and mighty discoveries. It is my belief that possibly an infinite number of universes exist in a type of laminated block separated by screens. Therefore, might it not be that an infinite number of laminated blocks exist? Thanks for listening. If you like what you just heard, you can hear more every week on the podcast Auditory Anthology, which is a partnership between me and Keith Conrad. I narrate the stories every week, he puts them together. I've got links in the show notes where you can find it. While you're at it, also be sure to share this episode with others who like strange stories, unsolved mysteries, and other weird things that you hear in the podcast. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks that I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. While on the site, you can also click on Tell Your Story to share your own true paranormal or creepy tale. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Stories I share on Thriller Thursday episodes are works of fiction. The Super Opener was written by Michael Zeroy, originally published in Worlds of If Science Fiction Magazine from August 1958. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 1 John 2 verse 17, the world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. And a final thought. He who gives you the day will also give you the things necessary for the day. Gregory of Nyssa. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. <laughs> <laughs>